on my All right. Why don't we get started? So we only have two papers um, this session because uh, Karin Fierke had to drop out. Um, the, the conception of this panel was these are the most empirical papers, um, and so this will be a good chance to see the rubber hitting the road, so to speak. Uh, we're going to start with Nora Bowman, who's actually from English literature, um, but deals with the relationship between the Canadian state and First Peoples, Indigenous Peoples in Canada, from a Newtonian versus quantum perspective of all things. So, um, so we'll start there, and then uh, we'll switch over to Anna, and I'll do that introduction as well. So, okay, thank you. Thank you, Alex. Um, okay. I also brought my copy of Alex's book because I. I was kind of hoping it was the most destroyed copy. But I'll talk. <laughs> I'll talk. Yeah, it, it's even. Yeah. Um, so my background is in English literature, although I'm a professor in interdisciplinary studies at Okanagan College. Which I was speaking with some people yesterday about kind of what that means to work at a, this college. It's kind of like a liberal arts college. Uh, in the U.S., but we also have sciences and nursing, things like that. Um, and I mostly teach gender and sexualities. I have a book coming out with the University of Toronto Press this fall about feminist resistance movements around the world uh, with a co-author from Calgary. And I've been involved in different kinds of environmental activism and organizing for about 25 years. And recently I've been working with Amnesty International to prepare some documents for the community to eliminate racial discrimination for their last few meetings uh, in Geneva. And my recent research was about uh, the ways in which Canadian mining corporations, in particular a corporation called Imperial Metals, take up the rhetoric of environmental and economic discord, uh, disaster to create a sense of economic urgency about their projects, and then how indigenous communities, cultural narratives resist through a variety of methods, resist the corporate capitalist ecological violence that has continually been inflicted on their communities. And then in another paper um, last year, I examined the role of impunity in Canadian corporate mining violences in Canada and in Central America. And for that, I followed Hannah Arendt's analysis of mechanisms of impunity in totalitarian nation building. And I use that to talk about Canada, which is generally not thought of as totalitarian or violent, but it is considered a, a model of sort of humanitarian goodness, partly in thanks to our dimpled prime minister, does a very good job of uh, advertising that. So he's, he's a nice foil. And then so I've been working on these issues of resource extractivism, mostly in British Columbia and the British Columbia interior, which if, you, if you're familiar with that region, um, the Fraser Plateau, kind of like the lower bottom half of the province. And as I was, as I've been working on these problems and trying to understand better ways to intervene in the state of epistemology, then I found Alex's book, um, which I've started reading. And I, so I'll, I'll, I'm going to try to talk a little bit about why I chose to work with Alex's book, or I'm trying to work with Alex's book, um, and then something about the Truth and Reconciliation in Commission in Canada, which some of you may know about, but some of you may not. So I don't want to be too repetitive on that, as some of you have been like reading and learning about this for years, but um, I'll, I'll present that a bit. And then I have some examples of what I'm working on and the research project for which I just got research ethics approval last month. And In 15 minutes. Yeah, I'm going to just... <laughs> uh, you know what, maybe I'll just skip the part I have about like your book in the beginning. <laughs> well, because everybody, I just, everybody knows that part, right? Okay, you already know that part. I'm going to just skip that, right? So um, I do believe that there is an ontoepistemological crisis in Canada following the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Uh, we, you could think of us as in a post-Truth and Reconciliation Commission state or not. The TRC is meant to reconcile the over 150 years of suffering resulting from a um, variety of violences from the colonial st state, um, mostly the, about 100 years of state-sponsored kidnapping, assault, and rape of indigenous children in residential schools. And so the TRC calls to action, call for changes to education, research, health care, justice, medicine, basically everything that our country administers. Um, 
and calls for a kind of national openness to indigenous narratives and indigenous, it doesn't say indigenous epistemologies, but says things like worldviews or ways of seeing and knowing. And if you look at education or music or film or culture in Canada, you can certainly see these shifts. So children are learning about it. Um, there's more and more funding for film and music about indigenous cultural worldviews. Our prime minister has a tattoo like, on his shoulder or something. So, you know, there's a, and sometimes indigenous leaders call this kind of the feathers. They mean this uh, in a derogatory sense. That there's a performance of um, kind of performative apology for the violences, the state violences. However, what I, what I really have come to, to, to see and believe after my years of this, this research is that when it comes to indigenous people's rights to land and water, the state expects dis discrete evidence, uh, material evidence, and that it operates much more in a Newtonian deterministic model and seems quite rigid to any sort of actual change. Um, it, it really operates on a very conflict-based legal process and, and still expects that indigenous people need to claim the, the land. And indigenous people generally would say that it, they, they, are, they talk about white land claims and indigenous title, which is a very different way of... But it's still, that even then, that's still very dualistic. Um, based in a sense, and cultural hegemony has always been the tip of the spear for colonial violence in Canada. That's why I'm working at, at, on this culture moment, if I can, that's what I'm trying to do. One of the first acts of colonialism was to, and this is from Glenn Coutard, a political scientist from uh, British Columbia, to forcibly indoctrin indoctrinate indigenous populations to the principles of private property, possessive individualism, and menial wage work. Um, and that these were an important feature of Canadian Indian, it's what was called the Indian policy at the very beginning of the kind of the foundations of Canada as a nation, and they, they continue today. Um, the residential schools indoctrinated indigenous people into values of wage labor, land ownership, Christian morality, Christian marriage, gender and sex roles, and white supremacist self-loathing of their own indigeneity. And just uh, for those of you who don't know um, m much about the residential schools, they also included medical experiments including studies on the effects of malnourishment and testing the effects of newly developed pediatric medicine on uh, children who did not know, or the, their families did not know about these. Many children suffered permanent damage. Um, just a new, a new study just came out last month about some of the residential schools that had um, electric chairs and sort of underground chambers for sexual assault. This is real. It's like horrible that it's actually documented and real, but it's really happened. And also these experiments took place after 1947 Nuremberg Code. And these residential schools continued until the 1990s in Canada. So most of the leaders and elders in Canada, I mean indigenous communities, survived these schools. So most people, kind of over 50 indigenous people in Canada have survived these schools. Um, and so their no indigenous knowledge that we have today has survived the system. Um, so I just have to go back a bit, right, to my um, in English we usually just read our papers straight through without any images or really off the cuff remarks <laughs> I'm afraid it won't work very well you'll be kind of bored if I do that um, but I, even though the state I think generally has a very kind of positivist um, materialist bent to the way it accepts evidence and judges evidence, indigenous testimony does make its way sometimes into, uh, into meetings. And I, I'm just going to give you an example of, um, I have to kind of move around a bit. Yeah, this is just one, one picture here. So the United Nations Working Group for Business Ethics um, sent a contingent for a representative to Williams Lake, which is a little town in the middle of BC. Um, to look into a spill, uh, one of the worst mining spills, maybe in the world, definitely in Canada, in 2014. And this is an elder, her name is Tina Sellers Ogden, she's from the Spartan <coughs> Nation. So she's actually given testimonial space in this meeting. The meeting was set up with like the UN folks kind of on one side and like the community members on the other side, and the UN was really seen by the indigenous people as an external force that would be sort of force, external presence that would be much more open. And so indigenous people would talk about the state as if the state wasn't present when the UN was there, which I thought was interesting. And this is what um, Tina Seller said. So, I mean, w what I really like here is that she says so many different things at one time. And this is the order in which she said these things as well. So 
Um, the first thing she does is she outright rejects the state's treaty process. Um, there, there has been no treaty on her territory and through most of British Columbia there have been no treaties ever signed. Um, it's unceded territory so it's an ongoing settler colonial process. So I think right away she tries to get out of this kind of legal positivism property rights discourse and just say I'm out. She calls forth right away the life of the land and she's exiting what I uh, what Alex talks about, this kind of deadness of materi materialism. And then she talks about the stream on Sequepma'ulu, which is her territory, which is about 600 kilometers from the Pacific Ocean. So there is no chance that any killer whale would ever make it to these lakes. And the, the spill that she's speaking to was into a lake. And so she's actually presenting this dream as testimonial evidence. And this particular audience was quite polite, but the dream was not questioned any further. It was not recorded and it was not re represented at all in the report and did not make it to Geneva in any form. Her testimony also does not separate poverty, particle board housing, uh, which is very bad, it's very flammable and not warm, um, from a lack of soup, the problems of consumerism and materialism, and she's brought to tears when she thinks about materialism because of the way in which it's antagonistic to life itself. And she's also upset about the toxins in her community's watershed, and she talks about the state violence as something like Chernobyl because she thinks of it as a threat of invisible particles that do harm to land, water, and community in unseen but widely felt relational effects. I believe that she's presenting um, what Barrett calls a relational ontology and that she's very much trying to resist the way in which the state wants evidence and presents evidence and wants Indigenous people to engage. I also think that Indigenous worldviews are sort of so inherently antagonistic to the states onto epistemology that they're, they're guaranteed to fail, that they're, it's built that way on purpose, I think, right? So in, mo in my previous publications, I wrote about these kinds of uh, presentations from indigenous community members, uh, but now I'm, I, I'm shifting to what is called like re researching up or looking up, and Glenn Kutari talks about that, as does uh, Strega, an indigenous anthropologist, ethicist kind of writer in Canada. Um, and I'm doing this for a few reasons. I think it's harder it's harder for me to analyze my, my own state, partly because I benefit from it so much. I have a lot of credibility as a professor, and I'm, I have some relationships of credibility with the federal government because I, I was involved in politics in the past. And so when I go to indigenous communities, people are like actually quite welcoming to me because I'm seen as some kind of ally. And then when I'm in universities and colleges, I'm seen as a good person because I'm sort of anti-racist. So I get all these kind of credibility benefits. Um, and my ontology is never questioned, so my sort of personhood brings, my, br brings me into all of these spaces. Um, and I think it's very difficult to look at the state. I, I think it's very easy to sort of look at the, the p potential kind of relational ontology or quantum effects in indigenous testimony, and other people have done that, and I, I don't want to do that. Um, <clears throat> instead, in the coming months, my work is to interview state, NGO, and corporate decision makers, and uh, statutory decision makers, so I want my interview subjects to be people who sit on boards and committees and hear this kind of testimony. Um, I'm going to show you some of the questions I'm asking them. They're, they start out kind of normal, asking them if they ask, if, you know, do you hear evidence? What do you think is true in that evidence? Um, what is data? And then I say, well, what do you think of things that seem kind of spiritual? What if you heard a story about a river and the river had a name? And then I get to this bit. Do you think a person can know things their ancestors knew? No. Do you think that dreams contain knowledge? Um, do you think that somebody can tell a story that comes from another person and, and can that story be true? So I contacted people who work for uh, the Ministry of the Environment and not a single one of them answered me. Um, but who, the people who are most interested in talking to me are people who re have retired from those positions. In my previous re research, I found that was also true, that people who have retired from sort of these positions in which they had this, this kind of power are very interested in talking about the ethical crises they faced while they were working there. Now that they're on their pension, they're much more comfortable critiquing it, which is fair enough. And I think that's also why the ethics for this took so long, because people are actually quite vulnerable. Now, these seem like kind of innocuous, almost boring questions sometimes, but I really hope that people get to this discussion and what I think is that they will say to me that probably privately they do think about their grandparents when they're sitting at work and they do think about stories that come from another time and another place and then they do think about the past as present now and the future as present now and they do think about lakes and rivers as sort of 
having a panpsychist ontology, I think many people do actually in some sense believe that or think that, but then they can't represent that in their own work, and when indigenous people present these narratives, they're sort of forced to reject them. Um, so I'm hoping for some kind of fissures in the state onto epistemology about resource extraction. We'll see if I get that. My, my interviews start next week. Um, but I don't know, do I have a, I just want to, okay. Um, the, the other thing I'm going to, I'm looking at in, in the meantime, while I've been waiting for these interviews to start, is um, National Energy Board hearings, um, and that, that's the kind of federal body that assesses um, energy projects like pipelines in Canada. <clears throat> and I have a small case study. I think I have time to talk about the case study, right? So in a December 2014 letter to the National Energy Board regarding a, a pipeline, the Kinder Morgan Trans Mountain Expansion Pipeline, which I think was just scuttled yesterday because of protests. That was a pretty big deal in Canada in the news that it was scuttled. Um, a representative for the Stalo First Nation, this is Stalo territory, um, objected to the terms that the NEB had established for oral traditional evidence hearings. So again, indigenous narratives kind of make their way into these spaces, but here, here are the limits that are, that are given, right? Um, the NEB procedures direct indigenous presenters that they may not, one, present technical or scientific information, two, present opinions, views, information or perspectives of others, three, present views on the decisions the board should make and opinions about the project, four, present recommendations to the board on whether or not to approve the project, and five, ask questions that require an answer from either Trans Mountain, that's the corporation, or the board, or rhetorical questions. Uh, what can they ask? Well, they can't ask any questions at all, basically. Um, and the, um, the NEV process does allow, in the case of oral traditional evidence, that Trans Mountain, that is the corporation, and other interveners will be given a short amount of time to verbally ask indigenous people questions about their oral traditional evidence. And the board may ask questions. I think this is a kind of epistemology. Um, Miranda Fricker talks about the way that a tree has knowledge if you cut it down and count the, count, you know, count the rings. This is the way I think about indigenous people being presented when, they, when they're trying to... You know, that's kind of the ontopistemological position that they're given in these cases. So the response from the style of First Nation, he says that, first of all, indigenous knowledge is not separate from scientific knowledge. He reminds the NEB that many of these scientific perspectives involve some technical information grounded in traditional knowledge. So he's reminding the NEB about these entanglements of, of knowledges. He refuses an artificial disciplinary separation. <clears throat> And then he says that the ban on presenting the opinions of others, which is the most, one of the most obviously deterministic directives from the NEB, is counter to indigenous traditional knowledge because indigenous traditional knowledge is based on the sharing of information between and among others, as is scientific knowledge, as y'all, I mean, the physicists are doing here today anyways. The NEB's monadic individual epistemology, what Barrett calls a spectator theory of knowledge, has little ground in any post-classicist cultural knowledge creation because it relies on separable data and atomistic speaker, speaker testimony. Um, and Barrett also says that knowing is a distributed practice that includes the larger material arrangement, ongoing open-ended articulation. And then as for allowing the corporation and the state to ask questions, of the indigenous people, but presenting the Stalo presenters from asking questions of the state or the corporation. The Stalo collective considers this obviously unfair and culturally inappropriate, that questions are only one dimensional, there's no entanglement permitted, no shared knowledge permitted, um, and kind of pushes indigenous people into a testimonial, sorry, d defensive position. And so at this point, the Stalo collective withdrew from the hearing process. Um, uh, completely, and this is an example of the way in which I think that indigenous knowledge, knowledge systems based on a relational ontology, which may or may not also be a quantum ontology, are unable to testify in a review process built on the, on the claims, uh, foundationally built on, um, on determinism. So, you know, whether this is by malevolent design, and some indigenous theorists say, you know, they're just trying to steal our land and we'll do whatever they want to do to do that, or a kind of happenstance outcome of methodological individualism, it still undermines indigenous testimonial credibility, and I think actually kind of pushes, pushes indigenous people back in this terra nullius position in which they're not really people and their land can be taken, which was uh, all of terra nullius, how, how it operated. Um, it, you know, in some, in some way, it might rely on negative prejudicial stereotypes, which are sort of these internalized um, kind of individual racisms that people have. I'm not saying that that doesn't exist, but I think that it's, it, I think it's bigger than that. I think it is more structural than that. Um, and I'm not sure if there's a kind of positivist Western court setting um, 
this is what the NEB hearings look like. They're, you know, they're very um, like a court setting. That, that any of them actually uh, would allow for collective testimony or for a relational ontology. Um, and so when I look at these, these documents, and when I think of the meetings I've attended, and the hearings that I, these kind of things that, I, that I've listened to and seen, I do see what uh, Alex calls the political slope of materialism with its picture of a deterministic reality in which the normal state of matter is death instead of life. And I suspect that individual testimonies like leanings towards vitalism and a, as well along with a flat ontology of human and non-human life and the inseparability of past, present, and future knowledge, um, that the, these, these have been presented to Canadian courts for more than 150 years. This is not the first time that Indigenous people have tried to say, this is the way we see the world. This is not even this is the way we see the world. This is the world. It's not a metaphor for the world, but this is the world. And that th this exclusion is not a new thing. This, is, this has not been invented recently. Um, and of course, the Canadian state came into, came into being about the time of Newtonian determinism's um, kind of like increasing influence on British imperialism. This is part of, of the building of, of Canada. Um, so I'm really curious about the settler colonial belief in an a priori dead world of potential resources, how this functions. I'm really hoping for some interventions because I don't actually believe that people walk around with these kind of deterministic dead views in their heads all of the time, especially the people who work, who work on these boards. Um, and also I do it because I'm still kind of an older activist in a sense, you know, in my heart, and I think that um, this world of dead things is really unlikely to resist capitalist compulsion to self-expansion because it draws a geography populated not by life but by these set of separable dead items that the only thing they're really good for is an accumulation of dead wealth. That's it. that um, we all try to keep our questions as short as possible and answer as short as possible mm -hmm. so we maximize the number of people who can participate as well. So, um, do call on? Um, short. Uh, yesterday a question that bubbled up was why turn to physics? You're, yep. You could ask a few why turn to native uh, ontologies and epistemologies, which I see quite a bit of in what, you know, the feminist new materialism, uh -huh. in a way, welding of Karen Barad, and then looking <coughs> at native culture <coughs> as a sort of way to get into different ways of thinking and doing and being. What would your, what would the, where do you see the fruitfulness? You're obviously more inclined towards the native than the physics. But you're, with Alex's book, you're bringing some of that to bear. What are you seeing as the fruitfulness of that as you're looking at this very uh, staid system of operation? Thanks. Um, I, I kind of rushed over some of my methodology and my decisions about that. So thanks for giving me an opportunity to speak to that. And that is for the, like, my research has actually not been, this is the first book I've read that has anything physics-y in it, which is why it's in such bad shape, because I had to read it six times, and I still barely understand it. Um, but I really like it. And that my research b began in resource extractivism in British Columbia, and because my background is, is English, I looked at narratives that were present in all sorts of public spaces. So I didn't actually, like, I, I'm coming from that perspective of trying to solve, I think, a, a really important crisis in Canada right now, um, and I'm experimenting on perhaps bringing in Alex's work to solve some of those problems. However, I'm not going, I don't want to publish any more about what Indigenous people say or are saying, uh, partly because it feels a little bit exploitative and I just get people like it so much and I'm a little bit suspicious of people's, I don't want this to be a set aside. it shouldn't be pleasurable talking about the deaths of, you know, people and water and communities and it's, you know, I'm a little uncomfortable with that, and instead what I want to do is get the people from the others. I want to get these guys in the room, and gals, and I want to ask them about their onto epistemologies. And what my theory is, is that they're, they're, more, they're more like a classical onto epistemology. And that to, to this like willful sense that is um, kind of ridiculous, because individually I think that those people probably understand the world in a non-classical sense. 
Um, yeah, so I, I'm, I, I don't, most of my relationships are with people on this side of the room, you know, um, but indigenous people are studied so much, there's a sort of like research fatigue amongst indigenous communities, and I don't want to contribute to that anymore. So. I guess piggy, I was trying to be short, piggybacking off of that, um, you know, it seems like we are turning either to quantum theory or to indigenous worldviews or all of these things essentially to address, um, you know, the sort of problematic inertias of the design of modern institutions, which takes us back to David Orwell's paper, I think. Um, you know, institutions we have and sort of discourses, pedagogic and otherwise, that do not respond either to our everyday experience or to our better theoretical, you know, findings. Um, and the trouble is we're always, I mean, the political difficulty here is that, um, you know, in an earlier stage, indigenous groups had to kind of turn wave into particle and had to kind of invent title claims and invent founded ideas and property and all sorts of things that would allow them to play this institutional game. That all got debunked as invention of tradition, and now they are sort of holding up indigenous worldview as this distinct and holy and different thing that is opposed to the Western, and the Western is absolutely reified as the classical institution. So I think your methodological stance is right to work on the Western side and to break that up, to be naturalized. Um, and unfortunately, that is a much longer, harder game. That's why I'm doing it, because it <laughs> seems more noble or something. <laughs> I don't know. Um, well, less ethically suspicious in terms of the overstudying of the natives. Yeah, that's true. But, but it's, uh, well, I mean, no, I've received a lot of support. And the indigenous communities, just this morning, someone emailed me and said, like, do good. You know, they, people like that I'm... You know, you can do that in, in, a, in a careful way, I think. Um, uh, but, I, you know, w when, I, when I actually sent out the emails to try and get subjects for this, they made their way onto activist listservs where I have all these, like, activists and indigenous people who want to take part in this study. I don't have anybody currently working on that side of the room who is willing to talk to me about do they think a river can be alive. Even though it is, it is like, thoroughly anonymized, I'm going to just go to extra lengths to anonymize this. And, they're afraid to talk to me, or I don't know, or they don't care. I don't say, they might not be afraid, right? I was just wondering how important this dimension of people in their heads, they don't really think possibly when I get them in context of most of the other possible viewpoints. I think so. I was wondering how important you think, you know, the, the layout of that room is, and yeah. if, how, if you had ideas about how changing the layout might have some effect. I, I think it's really important. I've thought about this a lot when I've gone to, um, you know, I've been to some indigenous community events that are extremely important in which power is passed along to a new community. The kinds of things that, you know, it, you know like the, yeah, a new, a new leader is announced or rights and title is announced and it's completely not like this at all. It is much more, it's constantly moving. People are milling about children or running everywhere all the time. Um, there's much more a sense of movement. People don't even start things on time. There's sort of like, it's happening this weekend sometime. So I don't really have a suggestion on how that kind of process could be replicated inside the NEB board Calgary hearing room. I think there would be remarkable resistance. Um, and I think, thanks for bringing that up, because I think when I look at this, honestly, it's so boring. I find it very difficult to kind of get excited about thinking about it alongside, alongside Alex's book, and when I go to an indigenous community meeting, there's all sorts of things that could be seen as quantum effects. But again, it's too easy. Um, yes, thank you. Could you know when I fly uh, in this time to land, you know? Mm -hmm. stratosphere for most of the meetings so far. And when pushed to engage the world, it comes with great hesitation by the macro theorists. <laughs> for you, it's Fair just, the, for you, it's just yeah. the opposite. You're very engaged in the world, and then you go to Alex's book. Yeah. This question you answer is addressed to that gray zone that is 
very difficult. Mm -hmm. Which translates something, and I know you don't like that, but which translates something into usable knowledge. And you use sort of things like tacit knowledge and practices, but isn't that where you ought to use quantum in a creative way to take on the project of modernity or Western? Self I mean, that's a, that's a struggle you will not win. Well, I mean... Or the other one, <laughs> yes. how to rearrange the furniture, mm -hmm. or how to get out of a particular way of allocating time, mm -hmm. that you might win. <coughs> we'll see. Thank you. I mean, I, I hope that something happens. I would say this is for me fairly experimental because my... You know, I've tried these kinds of interventions as an activist, and then I ran for the in federal election, and I'm involved in some like public broadcasting efforts, different kinds of things. But um, and I do know that this, on the one hand, is just theoretical enough that uh, you know, once I write it, once <laughs> just theoretical enough that it, it can't quite make its way into a policy room. But I also know that a lot of politi political scientists in Canada, like Glenn Coutard, their work is actually being influential on other on politicians who, who then make their ways to making those policies. So I think there is some opportunity. Um, and I also just think that in the, you know, the, the TRC calls for this kind of intervention. There are specific calls to action to post-secondary education to not just like, not just have an indigenous sculpture in, in the courtyard, um, but to change our very way of teaching and delivering knowledge and of grading and speaking to people in the room and to have less of a, of a model of a you know, receiver and, and, a, and a producer of knowledge and to change, to think about time in a different way. I think time is, a, I think time is actually more important than space in, in challenging um, the Western model of onto-epistemology in this, in this case with resource extraction use because the indigenous people, all, every, every time an indigenous leader stands up to speak, and I know it's very broad to say every time there's always an, a, a very long introduction of all of the, the ancestors of that person and um, kind of what, who that person is related to now, and then all of the grandchildren. And this is sometimes seen as something kind of cute, or um, how nice that they care about people, but it's not. It's a, it's a, it's a really important ethical call for responsibility, um, and it calls into being people who have existed and will exist. So it's, it is also, I mean, this is why it's also ontological. Um, I mean, little things like that could happen. What if every single person there had to talk about the people that came before them and their grandchildren? Before they spoke, even the people from Trans Mountain and Kinder Morgan, even that might be a kind of reasonable outcome. But thank you, Peter. Yes. I just to put myself on the list here just for a second. I guess I'm very interested in the question of resistance to quantum ideas and mm -hmm. why there's you know, tremendous resistance despite the clear problems of the classical orthodoxy. And I guess I'm two questions. First, when you went through all the prohibitions that the Canadian mm -hmm. courts had put on the indigenous people what they're allowed to say, did they justify all those prohibitions? Or was that just that list given to their interlocutors and that this is what your law was talking about and so on? And then secondly, I'm wondering if you could speculate on why you think no one wants to talk to you about their onto epistemology. Um, thank you. The first question, so first those uh, rules were given to the Stalo Collective, and then the Stalo representative responded with the letter, which I quoted from. And then another letter from the NEB went back, which explained each of the items, or it meant to explain them. And it basically said, you can't say these things here because there's another meeting in three months where you're going to get to say them. So it, it was not very, and it kind of said that um, you're, th this is a space for elders to present traditional knowledge. Yeah, it, it just kind of said, if you want to present scientific knowledge, for example, you can type it up in, a, in an essay and send it to us at this email address, but you cannot mix knowledges. There's a, there's a pretty heavy resistance to what is seen as sort of a mixing of knowledges, and I really think that that's an exclusion. That goes back to Terra Nullius and excluding people, indigenous people from human spaces, basically. Uh, you know, I'd, in my previous research about um, cattle guards, I did a project on cattle guards, um, and another one about the mountain pine beetle. Nobody currently working in a government position would speak to me. I think just that the fiduciary duty is, is, is a fireable offense in union jobs, and people are just, even though it's heavily anonymized, but then the number of people, retired people, basically will speak to me. I think they're just afraid of, of censure, some kind of censure. Yeah.
thank you. Um, uh, I'm, I'm afraid of <coughs> saying how much I enjoyed the presentation for fear that we will end it because it's. Um, <laughs> It's okay, you're the only person so far, so <laughs> it's, I'm good. So, um, uh, I'm, I think that I'm interested in sort of the way that you're mobilizing the quantum ideas, because it seems that there's kind mm -hmm. of two possible uh, justifications. One is that there's a good match, right? And I, I, it seems that that's the, you've appealed to this before in uh, yesterday, that there's a good match, that there's a kind of a correspondence between the way you, uh, the observations you have about entanglement or about um, uh, time or about causality that are really better explained by quantum than by uh, classical Newtonian quantum epistemology. Or there's the kind of claim that the quantum is really real and that it's really true. Mm -hmm. and that it's real, you know, which seems to conflict with the way that I understood you talking about uh, indigenous forms of knowledge, which also sort of make the claim that it's really real. And so I wonder sort of, uh, uh, have I understood that correctly? Mm -hmm. And uh, sort of like, how do you place those in conversation with each other? But I think the, the other thing that I'm mindful of is, you know, like in uh, Coulthard's book, you know, like the first stuff is all about, you know, the first chapter is all about Marx, you know, like mm -hmm. he uses a lot of classical Western ideas to mm -hmm. get to sort of excavating indigenous knowledges before he goes on to talk about other yeah. stuff. Um, can I just, would you say that your question is, the first bit of your question is, am I thinking of it kind of metaphorically or representationally, the, the quantum thinking? Mm -hmm. Or am I thinking of it as really real? Is that what you mean? Yeah, I think yeah. that that's, I think that my question is one that I, that I have with this. Okay. Project, yeah. which is that is the justification for apply or for using quantum theorization because it's really real, and then you have like a secondary question: Are indigenous knowledge is also really real, mm -hmm. but somehow differently really real? Or is it just because that these uh, concepts explain better what mm -hmm. you think the really real is? Yes, sense? thank you. Um, I, I think that they they are real. And that I think that most people also think that they are real, but have so much investment in terms of power and wealth and comfort in um, not thinking that they're real, especially in these kinds of settings. And so I, maybe it's, it could, could be irresponsible of me to do this, in which case I hope I clear it up later, to kind of almost do both. That is, you know, I, I, if you walk into a room and say, like, you're a walking wave function, it's, it's not a very, you know, I actually... I was in, in Brussels in the fall, and um, I didn't get any questions to my paper. I kind of got a, like, good job, little lady. Uh, so I, I'm maybe being a little bit more hesitant in, um, you know, especially when I do my field work, I'm certainly not going to give people any sort of ideas about what I might think the world is or is not. I'm kind of open to hearing both from people when I ask questions. Um, but I think it's actually more radical to say the indigenous worldview is as real or more real as actually real. Um, and that's what I want to push. I mean, I really want to ask the people when I'm talking to them, um, are you a whale? You know, is your grandmother really dead? <laughs> I don't want to, and these sound very, very bizarre questions, but when indigenous people come through and say these kinds of things, they're effectively kind of patted on the head. Um, and in, in the meantime, the lakes and rivers are being poisoned. You know, the Fraser River is full of arsenic and selenium at, at the same time. So. Um, I, I thank you. That is a, a kind of problem that I have to, I don't quite know what to do with that problem in a sense because I do want this work to be published and taken up in some kind of, we like Coutard's work is very influential, right? Um, and he troubles Marxism, you know, later. So, yeah, I'm actually thinking of something like Coutard's work is kind of what I would, would like to do with this. So, thank you, Mark. Time for one or two more. So, I, I want to get back to this ethical question because I think the hope is that if you do and the excavation on the Western majoritarian side is less ethically dubious, but I want to pose a kind of thought experiment and see what you think, which is that this move from uh, survivance, sort of Gerald Beisner, 90s indigenous theory, to this, mm -hmm. this move of resurgence, mm -hmm. um, that it's not a matter of just getting through in a particular sense, but like right. this like explosive growth, productivity, mm -hmm. activism, 
comes in a large part precisely because this fails. Uh, yeah. So I'm, I'm curious, there's a kind of crypto-normativism which suggests that if the shitty side of the room became quantum, that that would be good for indigenous people. But all I can think is if the shitty side of the room yeah. became quantum, that a kind of quantum cunning could develop, where mm -hmm. they realize, oh, actually, we're yeah. vastly more flexible. Uh, we should be incorporating yeah. all of these, these narratives and ways of thinking, because that's the only way governmentality is going to keep functioning. Right? Mm -hmm. So like, in what ways does yep. this attempt to do what you know, Latour calls cosmopolitical diplomacy right, function like diplomacy, right? which is that it can be leveraged for kind of strategic ends? I mean, you're probably right. I'm just thinking of the Canadian state. Well, it, it reminds me of patriarchy. You know, it's super adaptive. Yeah. You know, it just kind of keeps going no matter. It does look, we have a feminist prime minister. Canada's still a patriarchy. It doesn't really matter, right? Um, you're, you're, I mean, and I have really worried about this, and I thought that in a sense my project, even of appealing to the calls of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which themselves are really embedded in this side of the room, yeah. you know, even though Senator um, Murray Sinclair is a, highly respected indigenous leader, they still kind of come from the state. Um, so, th you know, for me it is a bit of an experiment and I feel like ethically I might be worrying too much about trying to recuperate the settler colonial genocidal state um, and it might fail. But the other problem is what if it doesn't fail in terms of publication and reception and, it, and so that I really like that but then it fails ethically because it kind of just gets sucked into the vacuum of power in any, I mean, I'm worried about that. I would really love a co-author because, so, oh, of course they will, and there'll be a ceremony and a statue and plaque and everything. So, yeah, I'm really skeptical that I, I, I mean, I would say I'm trying this, um, and I don't know if it's going to work. That's a, that's a pretty serious concern I have. So, but nothing, I mean, I, like, I'm also just one person. I'm personally not going to bring down the white supremacist state, probably. But I'm, you know, if I can, if I can just drive a little wedge. But, but think it's a, it's a pretty serious concern that I have. Thank you. Yeah, well, I mean, it doesn't help your academic credibility question, but um, this is very ripe for arts-based research. Yeah. Um, so I'm sure it's even that, that that would be an amazing place to go for. What do you mean by art space? I mean, this, in the, within the arts community, I'm, there's a much more flexible um, idea about what constitutes research and knowledge making, and um, you can play in the creation of art um, with ideas in a way that I think is, is harder to do um, when you're trying to write papers. And I, I, I can see that being very productive for exploring some of these ideas, but it does not help you. <laughs> Once you've done yeah, that, you kind of go I away mean, from But th then the second thing I wanted to, to say, though, is that um, I don't, this has come up with a couple, in, in thinking about a couple people's comments in different contexts. I keep thinking about, um, there's an entire uh, academic field called physics education research, which has for about 20 years been principally concerned with how non-intuitive Newtonian ideas are, actually. Um, and they've developed whole research methods. It, it, it comes from the problem of trying to educate physicists and how difficult it is to educate physicists. And it's a breakdown of the, of the ability to the mind to graph Newtonian concepts, which while in this context we're referencing those as if they are the same thing as intuitive um, physical understanding, mm -hmm. they are not intuitive not. at all. And the ways that the physics education researchers kind of, um, the research methodologies I think might be interesting for you because there's a lot of, um, in, of interview techniques digging into mm. worldview, um, and it's physical worldview, so it's perhaps slightly less ethically okay. complicated and less, um, but but I think that might be an interesting thing. Okay, I will. Thank I you. I think we should probably move on, just so we won't stay on time. So, uh, thank you, Nora. Thank you. We have Anna, from the University of Warsaw. Um, and I've forgotten how I got connected <coughs> to you also. But, um. Thank you. You have a clicker if you need it. Okay. Can you hear me? No, not yet. Maybe I don't need it, actually. Do I need it? At this volume, yes. We do need it. <laughs> But maybe the maybe the microphone. 
Okay. Because I oh now it's better. Yeah. This yeah. Okay, but it, does it work or not? It works. It works. Okay, let's go. Are you sure? Because I, I would prefer to move a little bit rather than now. It'll pick up. Okay. Okay. So if you don't hear me, let me know. Uh, so why why am I here apart from uh, the fact that I was kindly invited? Um, so let me start or let me start with some general remarks. Uh, even though I found it hard to be here yesterday on time, I'm very happy I didn't miss Michael's presentation. And uh, especially one moment during this presentation was important for me. When Mike was uh, uh, showing his slides and was moving from one to the other, and at one point he said, if you haven't been surprised yet, now I will show you. <laughs> yes, so this is... Uh, and uh, I, found, I find this kind of moment especially important in work of researchers, no matter what discipline <coughs> we are in. So this is my first point. The second point is about uh, going to physics rather than philosophy uh, in order to look for ideas. Which one is good? So actually, I must say that as far as 20th century is concerned, it doesn't matter because we don't yet know what is the philosophy of 20th century. Uh, I don't think it has been defined, just like we didn't know how philosophy of 17th or 18th century would look like. So, for example, who are the malbranches of 20th century? Yes, and those of you who know a little bit about <laughs> philosophy know that malbranche was the major star. Yeah. Yes, and now who cares about malbranche? Yes? So who are Leibniz's of 20th century? I mean, people who are celebrities, yes? So uh, I don't think that the history of philosophy of 20th century is close, and I believe that some of the major physicists will be major philosophers. Uh, and it's possible, like, for me, it's purely, it's very, I can easily imagine that the top three of 20th century philo philosophers will be Einstein, maybe Gödel, and maybe Foucault. Why not? Yes, so it's just, why, we could imagine it, we don't know it yet, yes? So this is the first thing, so why not taking from physicists? Uh, why physicists may be good to learn from? So firstly, I think, going back to Michael's presentation, they are some of the major intellectuals in 20th century who provide us with surprise. Uh, so when I read Einstein, I understand nothing from his equations. But I, I, I can find there the idea that actually word, the word is profoundly mysterious. And Einstein actually believed that, that there is huge mystery in the world. And he was not, uh, he, and he was a physicist at the same time, yes? And uh, when, I, when we... And yesterday we referred to it, major quantum physicists were also major philosophers and they, they didn't think that actually word is so obvious. So, uh, the, and I believe that all major social scientists were also surprised by the world. This is necessary, this is a necessary experience in order to produce meaningful uh, academic work. And this leads me again to Michael. Well, yet when I talk to people who participate in different research programs and different disciplines, I find considerably re less surprise when I talk to people who do social science than when I talk to people who do physics, natural sciences, and maths. So the more Michael moment very rarely will happen at ISA. Yes, you will never encounter anyone. Maybe it's very rare. I mean, there are very few individuals among social scientists who tell you, look how surprising it was. <laughs> and, and actually, I think that if we, and I was at ISA on the panel about uh, taking ideas from physicists, and I believe you were on this panel, uh, yes, as one of the speakers, it was interesting. And one of the panelists said that 
uh, social sciences, we do difficult science. And uh, natural, nat natural sciences are easy sciences. And, well, I can take it. But if we do difficult science, I believe we should be surprised even more frequently, yes? yes. And it's the opposite. Yes. So, uh, if we, if I would, uh, would be tempted to take a stand, stand on a, uh, so, uh, being natural sciences, being supreme to social sciences, I, think, I believe they may be, for the moment, interesting point of inspiration just because they are learning us, learning to be surprised. So this is, this is why I'm here, and I believe Alex's project is amazing because it's one of very few things I have seen recently which actually encourage us to admit that sometimes we are surprised, yes? So this is why I'm here. And uh, when I read the book, uh, I, because I'm also, I, uh, I graduated also from philosophy, uh, I was of course tempted to try to develop it conceptually, but for me, trying to apply it and and actually acknowledge that sometimes we are surprised was much more tempting because of the first point which I made. So that's why I was looking for a, for a case uh, which would uh, uh, somehow enable uh, me to maybe show that the reality which we are dealing with, the social reality, is less stable than most social theories claim. And I think this this is true not only for positivist theories, but also for critical theories. Actually, I believe that uh, even though those who developed critical theories were deeply surprised by what they were uh, observing in the, in the surrounding world, the, the programs, the kind of research which is generated by critical theory is clear. Very often you will see the title and you can guess what we yes. will find. <laughs> so, uh, so, so this is, uh, so none of, none of the major theories is good in embracing the fact that sometimes we are surprised and given what we are doing, we should be surprised. So now uh, my, my uh, humble, uh, my humble uh, try to contribute. So I was looking for a case which would actually show that uh, sometimes we, we, we are surprised and that uncertainty of certain situations and, uh, uh, and that the, uh, a lot of concepts from Alex's work could be, could be applied to this. And uh, uh, being from Poland, but not just situated, no, we were watching closely uh, the situation in Ukraine at the end of uh, 2013 and the beginning of 2014, and especially uh, the, what, was, what followed annexation of Crimea and the very event. And uh, myself, I was uh, very much interested in... Uh, my, now I would like to move to my case. So, uh, Kharkov, uh, which as you can see it's on the border with Ukraine and Russia, uh, is, a, is, a, is a very interesting place which could be used as a, as a case to demonstrate some of, the, some of the concepts. So this is the second largest city of Ukraine, uh, 1,500,000 inhabitants, which is only 30 kilometers from Russian border. And uh, in uh, 2014, actually the, after uh, annexation of Crimea, the situation on the, the whole eastern border of Ukraine was very uh, uncertain. And the uh, uh, Russian army was operating during, uh, along the whole border, but primarily near Kharkov. And uh, at the, in, in February and March of 2014, it looked as Kharkov will be is the most likely place when, where the separatists attempt and the, 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 uh, the um, attempt to uh, take 
even larger part of Ukraine will start. It was certainly not Donetsk and Lugansk, which ended up as the places of separate. Now it's very rarely uh, debated, but uh, while visiting Kharkov, it became for me very clear that, uh, the, that there is something in how the history has been made afterwards. And this led me to connecting this case to Alex's book. So I will show you a couple of photographs to, to, to maybe make it easier for you to imagine how it looks like. So this is the Tsarist Kharkov, because uh, Kharkov uh, in the Tsarist, uh, actually in 19th century, when, uh, when this was the part of Russian Empire, uh, experienced very uh, um, intensive development, which you can see also in material facts, in, in material reality of the city. This is uh, 19, 1920s, Kharkov became the capital of Soviet Ukraine. It was not Kiev. And actually, it was a place of futurist, early communist project with a lot of architecture also uh, materializing this progressive project. This is a major, this is one of the largest squares in the world, which is in Kharkov. This provincial city near the border, which used to be a capital, you can see it. During the war, uh, big transport planes were landing there. This is Lenin, and Lenin was on the major square of Kharkov until 2014. And this is the Russian flag, because Actually, the separatist attempts in eastern Ukraine later than in Crimea started there. And it was the first place where uh, Russian, pro-Russian demonstrators uh, started to occupy local buildings, putting Russian flags on the roofs. And ultimately, it was unsuccessful. Uh, here you can see Lenin falling from the from the monument, but it was not clear what's going to happen uh, in this situation. So I would like to, so uh, I take this situation as a situation of deep uncertainty. Both of the act major players, both of from the side of Russia, <coughs> who actually thought that it will be possible to, uh, to start a kind of uh, pro-Russian revolution in the city, on the other side, on the Ukrainian side, which was very much afraid that Kharkov will fall per first, because there are a lot of records showing how uh, uh, intellectuals and politicians in Ukraine were actually afraid that Kharkov will fall as the first place after Crimea. And also a lot of uncertainty among local population, which uh, accompanied uh, those events. And uh, because we have now in Poland, two million Ukrainians, uh, and uh, it's easy actually to find people who were in Kharkov during those events. I talked to many of them, and actually the, 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 the narrative of uncertainty, and actually also uncertainty of who we are, and what state we belong to, what should we choose in this situation, is very common. I mean, if you only, because first you ask them why Kharkov stayed in Ukraine. So first they will tell you the common narrative about the interior minister of Ukraine being from Kharkov, Arsen Avakov, who knew people and he could keep it. But when you go deeper immediately, they will tell you how uncertain the situation was. And also when you talk to Ukrainian officials, they will admit that it was not that clear that the city will stay with Ukraine. So uh, using this case, I would like to uh, show firstly to, to develop a little bit more concepts of non-locality in space, how actions of different actors produced certain states, says like, produced like the collapse of, of potentiality of local <coughs> agents, yes? made them to choose who they are uh, for the certain moment. And then I believe it's not forever. I believe it's then this, uh, uh, this, un this unstable reality returns after the, the point of measurement finishes. <coughs> 
Uh, and uh, when I started to uh, study Kharkov a little bit more, I found that actually it's a great place to, so, so, to show also uncertainty of the past. Because, the, because of the borderland, which Kharkov is, which became a bordered land, as a lot of Ukrainians say, uh, you, can, you can find a lot of narratives about statehood, which try to produce meaning for this place. Is this place actually Ukrainian? Is this place Russian? Is this place neither Ukrainian nor Russian? And it's surprising how diverse those language as a structure, narratives about Kharkov are. Because just to give you a flavor, when you take the most classical Ukrainian historian, Khrushchevsky, who produced all the narrative of who Ukrainian, Ukrainian nationalism, actually he thought that Kharkov is not Ukrainian. So even if you take Ukrainian narratives about what is Ukraine, Kharkov is not always included. It's a deeply contested place. And uh, uh, when I went to Alex's book, because for me, this case of failed separatist attempt also can help us to better understand, um, using the quantum terms, what state could be. Uh, because uh, uh, actually, it was the, the, it was the attempt to, to actually show that this place was not Ukraine, but in this very moment become return to the, to the moment when it would, would be, when it is a Russian, a Russian state. Uh, just like Crimea, just like, like, just like it happened with uh, Crimea. So, I'm sorry, it's sometimes hard to uh, navigate in foreign language explaining that, but uh, I will be happy to clarify uh, uh, in the, in, during the, the Q&A. And my last points, so when I try to unpack the, the idea of a state, going to Alex's book, the major problem which I find is that when you define a state, you firstly you refer to a state as a particular language structure, and this could be analyzed. We can see those different layers of language structures as when applied to uh, this particular case and also all the other cases. And uh, secondly, you, you say that a state uh, are individual actions of agents. And this also can be shown. And actually, I was surprised to find a lot of fascinating anthropological and ethnographical work about Kharkov and um, local people, how actually they practice state and they, how they practice borders. Actually, they didn't, they, it was very unclear what kind of uh, actions uh, what kind of practices were, were they undertaking uh, as far as borders are concerned? Because the borders between 2014 didn't function as they function in normal uh, 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 countries of the center, center of the world. It was very... Um, so the practices weren't necessarily reflecting the state division which was 30 kilometers from the place. And there is a lot of le research to illustrate it. And then uh, my problem is that from language structures of a state and state as practices of individual agents, I'm not sure what is the way to quantum theory. So this is my problem, that we can show language structures and nicely illustrate variety of layers of language structures we can so show ambiguities of practices, but my problem is would it lead us to the, to the quantum theory? So this is a question I would like to ask you in, in the, on this occasion. And then uh, it's also, there's also a lot of material which may show us how coherence was put, put backwards on this, on this case. Because now when you talk to all experts of Russia and Ukraine, of course it's clear for them that Kharkov would always stay with Ukraine because, and there are many reasons why it would stay. Whereas if you read really quality scholarship from 2012, there is a lot of debate how an ambiguous place it actually is and that the status of it is very uncertain, especially given uh, 
the, the revisionists, some revision, revisionist discourses is in Russia, because there was always fear that uh, certain revisionist discourses in Russia will turn into an aggression in Ukraine. And actually Putin also many times said that this, this is not a, a real state. So uh, Ukrainians themselves uh, weren't actually sure until 2014 if this was their territory or not. Thank you. Yes? Yeah, I'm a historian. And I, as you were speaking, uh, at the very beginning talk, I thought of a number of historical examples, such as Alsace and Lorraine, you know, between Germany and, and uh, France, leading this First World War. All the irredentist movements in Austrian Hungary Empire, particularly focusing in Serbia, part of the First World War. Sudan Germans leading the Second World War. And I've heard, read lots of notes of this. Nothing about quantum theory. And uh, I just, and this, and sometimes actually try to apply quantum theory, not that successfully in my own work, but I just don't see why a theory that is about the behavior of, of electrons adds to this. And I can't imagine, you know, speaking to my colleagues in history and introducing quantum theory to explicate this issue. And I ask you, sort of, maybe that's a question you have. Um, why do we need it? What does it add to this, this historical geopolitical Uh, so, particularly uh, from, the, from uh, the theory as we got it in the book, I think that the coherence which is put backward, this is something which, uh, which definitely uh, could be applied. And uh, I don't think that uh, uh, even in studying how discourses emerge and deconstructing them, uh, I think that this idea that actually coherence is imposed backwards is very common. So I believe that for historians, this could be uh, still interesting. I don't know what is your take on that. Well, I don't want to mean, it was just a question. You know, I, mean, mm -hmm. I, I just felt that you're pushing it. I mean, your passion, your interest, your data is immersed in, to me, a very traditional historical analysis of uncertain identity politically in the war. Uh, and I just, the non-locality just seemed tacked on, or I'll say it, it seemed kind of tacked on. Mm -hmm. So it seems to me it's, mm -hmm. it's a question, I can, criticism, and I've spent 10 years on a book trying to ground it, was cultural history, causality, and quantum theory, pretty much failed. I finally gave up. I realized, hey, wait a minute, quantum theory is about electrons, I'm running about human beings. And, uh, but I tried. So, mm -hmm. The question is synthetic, right? We've seen the kind of challenge. So the, the non-locality is that uh, you actually, by action, constitute certain state. So it's, I believe that uh, what uh, traditional so social sciences uh, make us to think is that the solution was out there, yet we didn't know it. Maybe we confused things. Maybe it was impossible to guess, but the, I think what quantum theory brings is actually that the very setup which occurred produced this situation. And also when you look, for example, when uh, on the research showing the identity, how people identify themselves in, uh, in Harbour, uh, after 2014, th their responses <coughs> got changed. So, for example, there are very few people who self-identify as Russia. It used to be 35% who self-identified as Russians. Now, it's um, the, the number of uh, those who declare this kind of self-identification decreased by 50 percentage points. So, uh, I think that it produced different kind of identity. Yes, and if we uh, understand identity as something stable, uh, we, should, uh, we shouldn't assume it to happen. And you may say that maybe they respond differently because it's politically, more politically 
bias, but when you actually, I think that when you uh, do interviews, <coughs> when you talk with, with people, I think they will acknowledge that this situation produced new reality on the ground. Uh, can I yeah. just on this very point? Yeah. I mean, I guess um, to me, that's one could imagine a classical story where, you know, through events, people change their minds, they change their opinions, identities change, and that's mm -hmm. all kind of very consistent mm -hmm. with this traditional causal story mm -hmm. moving forward in time. And what I liked about the title, but you didn't say much about it in the talk, was this idea of a backward imposition of meaning. Mm -hmm. right. um, that's the non-local kind of thing. I think what you need to do in the paper or in the talk perhaps is make that more puzzling. Mm -hmm. You know, but we do this all the time actually. It's always the future that determines what's happening right mm -hmm. now. But that's actually from a classical mechanical standpoint, what does that even mean? Mm -hmm. Right? So I think if you can kind of make that puzzling, then that becomes something that needs to be explained and that becomes a reason to invoke quantum argument, because that's the only way to make sense of such a, a bizarre kind of um, backward causation. It's a kind of backward causation. Yeah. 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 So, mm -hmm. uh, so. Jump in on that? Yeah. Okay. No, because I think you're, I actually think you're onto something, actually. And in terms of one of the things that I picked up from the book that I think is really powerful. Because look, look at it this way. Basically, if a quantum viewpoint potentially could redefine what revisionism means. Because when we think about revisionism, we normally presuppose there's been this kind of narrative going along and then somebody changes it, right? But if the idea is that at various kinds of decision points, and this is where the issue gets a little tricky from a quantum standpoint, what, is, what counts as a decision point, both the past and the future are redetermined. Okay? Um, and, and so in a sense, in a way, you're manufacturing both the past and the future in terms of at least the possibility space, in terms of what's reasonable all the time. That's kind of what's going on here. So the, the concept of revisionism presupposes a kind of classical model. Right? And, and, and what you're talking about, because, and that's why it has a kind of negative sort of view in a way, because it, it sounds like you're denying something that everybody already knows and you're moving against it. Whereas, in fact, you're sort of imagining here with this quantum model that from moment to moment you're reconstituting both the past and the present possibilities. But any flat footed empirical historian would just know that intuitively. Right. Some, kind of, well, like some me, would. Like me and all my colleagues over there. No, no, but the point is, no, but, but it does change the spin on certain words like revisionism, right? Because revisionism presumes that there is a kind of dominant narrative already, whereas the quantum view kind of, in a way, loosens up your intuitions about dominance, right? Because from moment to moment, things are being reconstituted both in the future and the past. So the, so the idea of there being some kind of past burden or past momentum that's pushing you forward to a certain kind of future, and if you resist it, you're against it, that kind of image disappears. That's what seems to me happens. I think one of the things that could maybe clarify it is having a better foil uh, for the other kind of explanation. So the thing that I was hearing through the whole talk is this is a great both secularization and repudiation of this sort of classic Benedict Anderson story, right, where there's this sort of shared, imagined community, but we have to, like, Pilfer Walter Benjamin to this transcendental plane where a shared community exists, right? This shows that there was this actually very complex and simultaneously shared community. But then at a particular event, right, you have kind of like a wave particle fly. Right? That that actually does seem like a classic history problem, which is that historians always want to talk about social consciousness, but they have no idea what social consciousness is. This seems like it's actually showing us the materiality of, of social consciousness, but maybe you have to kind of set up the traditional story of, of how it happens in order to sh see that. Well, actually say something about the decision point. Yeah. yeah. I think that's the key thing about what the decision... Okay. Sorry. Colin. Yeah, I mean, I think you've got to mention the distinctions here, because I dis disagree with you, Steve, in one way. It's what, what, what you're reconfiguring is the understanding of the past and the present, and the, then you reconfigure the potential of the well, that's one reading. That's one reading, that's yeah. a certain... Yeah, but, it, well, if you're going to say you're reconfiguring the past, you have to go back to the past to be able to demonstrate that. I mean, you can make a claim, but how are you going to demonstrate that? And you can only do that, as far as we know, from the present. So you're still stuck with a, an understanding... A lot of, has been but realism. Okay, okay, okay. That's, that's, okay. Sorry. <laughs> so do you have a question for Anna? No, no, no. It's just, it's just yeah. enough. Oh, okay. All right, okay. Um, also, maybe a comment to your question. Oh. Uh, also... Uh, of course, uh, so one has to be 
framework, whether one just uses the framework or one tries to really uh, uh, build a bridge to quantum theory. Quantum theory has also the, the dynamical aspect. And uh, here, there's no dynamical aspect or we are ignorant about it. can be any dynamics, any individual. So I think one has to distinguish this. Otherwise, if one pushes too strong, to, tries to apply the same dynamics of electrons to social science, of course, it's, it will never work. So I, I would say to make clear when we are trying to do this, to justify the quantum framework, we are ignorant of all the dynamics. Other thoughts? Uh, along the same lines, basically. Um, I think, um, when I had to say this, but this is a very, um, not unique, but a limited reading of what the quantum is when it comes to these issues. Because the, the problem of time in, in for quantum physicists is a huge one and has yet to be solved, and I thought it would be something our last time anyway. So um, I think one has to be very careful uh, to specify that this is a certain reading of a limited uh, body of literature that deals with these issues of backward and forward. and uh, Because you talk to other physicists and you, you could just start laughing about that because to them the problem with time is huge and has yet to be resolved. And this brings me to the other uh, issue that I know and my colleagues here from uh, humanities might know better than me, but many other uh, outside the mainstream social science and humanities have dealt with these issues and philosophy, you know, with philosophy too. So potential, I mean, potential and, and, and all these, these uh, dealings with, with the past and the present and how it is determined and not. And can say the same thing. Why go to the point? Uh, I mean, I, I have no, there, I, I don't think there is an ultimate reason for the moment to go for the quantum. I think they are trying different things. So this is, I, I don't have ultimate reason why, why this approach. I have an ultimate reason for you. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to actually make sense of the historian's routine and all our, our general practice of uh, filling in the past with the future, if you want to make sense of that physically, the only way to do that is in a quantum physical frame. Right? If you want to understand that in a class, it, presumably everything is physical again, right? So, and this whole idea of filling in the past doesn't make any sense from a classical Newtonian framework. So, that's, right. that's the argument for going for a quantum one. Now, if you want to take it literally, you could say, well, going back to Collins' point, well, we're just reinterpreting the past. And I guess that's the burden of the chapter that Colin is referring to, that it's not just reinterpreting the past. Um, but I think that that's the argument. Right. So, exactly. But yeah. Yeah. And another answer to that, which seduced me for a long time, is I want to do general cultural history, and I want to unify. So you begin with the most fundamental, the simplest. You know, I mean, Comte began with what astronomy, physics, chemistry, physiology, biology, sociology. This notion of going from the, the micro to the macro is the most micro. So it's very tempting. It's almost irresistible. You go down there and you find, wow, there's stuff going on that doesn't apply. You know, that's, that was what, not a meal. Peter? Oh, oh, Peter. Because when I ended up with the question of connecting, was she's very aware of the things that we are telling her. And she's not that she's a movie. So I want to ask, what would be the uh, bread and butter distinction between me making remaking of the task is utterly essential, not just reinterpreting it, but it's right. But how would I know when I see it, a remaking operation to so the reinterpreting? I mean, I it, it happens in a space that is exclusively dominated by some sense of the task, that is politics. But how would I know one as opposed to the other? So uh, I think that the answer is philosophical, this question. I, I believe you can, it's not in observation. Because if you take uh, meaning 
as something which exists, but actually reinterpreting is reconstituting as far as I understand it. So the, the thing is that this approach takes reinterpretation as something much more serious than uh, interpretative mm -hmm. context. Mm -hmm. This is how I would express it. Yeah, so yeah. it takes reinterpretation as reconstitution, much more, no? Well, well I, yeah, yes, I would, yeah, sure, yeah, I guess yeah. the way I would put it is that, that it, remake, it all depends on what an event is. And if the reinterpretation view assumes that the event is complete at the moment that the event happens, and it's back then, and so you, it's only, all we can do is reinterpret it. But if the events, in fact, extend into the present, then you're constantly remaking those events, yes. to or adding to them, or replacing them, or, or modifying them through our current. So it's a question of is there a non-local connection to the past or not? And that's, I think, not just a philosophical question. That's probably a, an, an empirical question of well, what is the event that we're interested in? Yes. You know, what was World War II? And when you start specifying what was that event, you may be able to see that there's a lot of making going on backwards, yes. and not just well, I, I, I yes. But it can be done. It can be done. Yeah. 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 Yeah.